Good morning. It's good to see you this Sunday morning here in Ohio. It's 70 degrees. How unusual this time of year. It's a beautiful day, and I'm glad to be with you again today. We are in the book of Revelation, and one of the things that we're reminded of as we go through this book and as we simply read the scriptures is life isn't easy. It's a challenge to us. We face real adversity, not only in this life, but we face adversity simply because, just because we love Christ, because we're Christians, we're followers of Jesus Christ. The passage we're going to look at today reminds us of that. And so as we look at the book of Revelation, we simply, the focus is Jesus Christ. He is, he is transforming everything, all things. He's doing it now, and we see it come to completion here in the book of Revelation. In chapter 1, we see the first section of the book of Revelation. We see Jesus Christ. John writes, what has he seen? Jesus says, write about the things that you have seen, but what, what has he seen? He is seeing Jesus Christ exalted, magnified in, in full glory. What a contrasting picture to what he saw when Jesus came as a servant, a humble servant, in the incarnation, virgin birth, to the cross. Now he's seeing Jesus Christ in absolute victory and glory. In chapter 2 and 3, we come to the second section of Revelation. That's where we're in now. John is writing about the things that are, what's, what's current, what's present as he's writing, and what's current in, in, the, in the age of the church, because we believe that these letters are written not just to these seven historical and local churches, but they are intended for the churches throughout the region of that day, and they, ultimately they are intended for his church, including us today, until this church age comes to an end. And so John is writing to these seven churches specific messages from Christ to them and to us ultimately. Last week we saw the church of Ephesus, and the challenge and the reminder was that Jesus Christ loves us. He called Ephesus the church of Ephesus. He commended them for many things, but he called them to love him, to return to their first love. He calls you and I to continue to cultivate, nurture that love for God, for Jesus Christ in our life, and keep it on the burner, to keep it at the very front as the priority in our life all the time. Today we come to chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And we are reminded, we see today in Christ that he is, he is our victory. He is our victory. The first, so he does two things with each of these uh, seven churches. And the first thing that we're going to focus on now as we come to this text, the first thing that he does with each of the churches is he reveals the need of the church. And so we're going to see that and understand that. We all, we all have needs in our life. And Jesus Christ, with his word, speaks into our life. And he reveals those needs so he can help us, he can encourage us, uh, he can give us a glimpse of, of his grace, his sufficiency, of his holiness, and call us forward. Again, we're in Asia Minor in modern-day Turkey. We have these seven churches. John is on the island of Patmos. He's been excommunicated there. He writes to Ephesus, which is the first city, if he would have come off of the island onto the into Turkey, and then going north and then back around, you see this road, that, that this route in Rome that would have been followed to follow these churches. And so the first thing that happens is he writes to a specific church, to the angel of the church and to the pastor, the messenger of the church, and we've talked about that. The church today is the church of Smyrna. It's uh, modern day Izmir, Turkey. This city was founded by Alexander the Great. Uh, very famous, had, had many uh, schools, museums, uh, science. Um, it, was, it was a location of, of the Olympics. Um, they had a huge amphitheater there that was significant. People would come to. And so athletics was very much, would have been very much a part of, of this city, its history. And uh, so money came into this city. And so we see these things. So, so, um, John is writing specifically to this church. It's about uh, 35 miles north of Ephesus. And it's a different church, though, a different location, different place. The second thing that he does with each of these churches is, as he identifies the church, it's like calling us by name and then speaking into our life. That's what he does. He calls them by name, and then he speaks into their life. He assesses the church. Jesus says, I know specifically these things about you, your church, your ministry. Jesus is revealing his, his omniscience, that he knows all things. And what an encouragement that is. He knows all things about our life. And so he can help us and he can, he can be sufficient for everything in our life. So 
So he's going to reveal in their life. He says, this is, so let's look into that. What is, what is revealed? He says, number one, I know your tribulation. As we, as we go into the text, we come to verse 9. And uh, he says, I know, I know your tribulation. I know your hardship. Um, I know, the, I know the, the persecution that you're under. Jesus says he looks into their life, into their ministry. He understands and he sees. In fact, all these churches are experiencing the suffering of being under the, under the thumb, under the rule of Rome. Here it becomes a significant uh, characteristic of this church. Um, they're under Rome. They have refused to compromise. They have refused to bow down. They have refused to worship Caesar as Lord. That is one of his edicts uh, to all those who are in, uh, under their um, oppression. And they have refused to do that. Smyrna itself um, is, uh, means myrrh. And so, you know, we, we, have these, uh, we have these pictures of understanding when we think of myrrh. When Jesus was in, in the manger, the wise men brought a gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It would look ahead to his death. Uh, Smyrna was known for, for uh, this resource. It's a spice used to embalm bodies. It was uh, used to dull the senses. Jesus was offered myrrh uh, in his drink on the cross. He refused that. He went through that experience on the cross with his senses fully intact. And so death... I don't think by accident it's associated with the name of this church and ultimately with the experience of this church. They faced, again, real persecution from the Gentiles, the Gentiles who were loyal to Rome, who, who supported the worship of the emperor. They were, they were a host site for uh, temples that, that people came into from around the land to visit and to, and to offer... Um, worship and praise to Caesar. And then the Jews, there was a large Jewish population there, and they strongly opposed the Christians. And so from both sides, they're experiencing hardship, adversity. Everywhere they turn, they're facing this as a church. About 60 years later, after John writes this letter, uh, one of the famous pastors who was there, bishops who was there, Polycarp, is burned alive because he refused to worship Caesar as his Lord. So this is what the Lord says. He says, I know your tribulation. I know your tribulation. He says, your faith is genuine. As Paul would say, Paul came to strengthen and to encourage uh, them to continue in the faith. The Lord is doing the same thing into the life of this church. That's what he does into our life. He comes to strengthen us, to encourage our faith, to sustain our faith, and, and reminding us that as, as children of God, we are, we are going to go through many tribulations, times of real adversity in our own life, simply because we are identified with Jesus Christ. We are walking as a light in a very dark world. In the dark, the dark always responds initially with, uh, with violence, uh, with hatred against the truth of God's Word. But he reminds us, I love you so much, I love you so much. Paul picks this up. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Smyrna is facing real persecution, real hardship. When you and I are facing these same things, it brings strength to our heart. It is an encouragement to know that the Lord loves us. And in fact, He even allows these things into our life for His purposes. And He's doing it because He deeply loves us. He loves you deeply. And when He allows hardship to come into your life, I want you to remember that the Lord loves you in the midst of that. I want you to remember that because God has allowed you to go through that. He's doing something beautiful in your life. And He's reflecting ultimately this, that He loves you. So I don't know what it is you're going through, but I want you to be encouraged that that's true. As it was for Smyrna, it is for us today. He says, I know your tribulation, and he says, I know your poverty. This was a church that was uh, destitute. It was not a rich church. It was, it was not a church that, that had great powers, not a church that had great uh, influence, as it were, you know, one of the big churches. It wasn't a church in today's economy that would have many programs and all these kind of things. It was a church that maybe was small. It was a church that simply didn't have the, the means and, and were having to trust God day in and day out faithfully. Uh, it was a church that simply couldn't make ends meet well. The word here just uh, just indicates that they simply had nothing left over. They had nothing. They were in need constantly as a church. But he says this amazing. He says in verse 9, he says, I know your poverty, but then he says in verse 9, but 
Boy, how significant that is. Says, but you are rich. You are rich. So let's, let's, let's bring a biblical perspective to the words that the Lord shows us this morning for Smyrna and for us. In Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses, uh, chapter 6, verse 2, 4, 7, and 10. Behold, now is the favorable time. Now today is the day of salvation. Salvation is the key. Is the key it's the catalyst. Because of that, he says, we are servants of God. And as servants of God, we commend ourselves. Here's what, here's what God has done for us. By integrity of speech, truthful speech, we have the truth. We have the power of God. We have the righteousness of God. We commend ourselves because this is what God has brought into our life. And then, and then he adds this phrase here. And we are poor, and yet we make many rich, and we have nothing, and yet we possess everything. It is a biblical perspective that changes our life. When we look at ourselves and look at our church and, and, and uh, sometimes feel like we just don't have much to offer, we remember the riches that we have in Christ. And that is meant to be an encouragement and refreshment to your soul. 2 Corinthians 8 9. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. He, he set aside all the glories, all the riches of heaven. And he came down and he lived among us. And he died for us. And he set all that aside. And he gave it away in a sense. Set it aside. And then, and then he picks it back up. So that you and I... By his poverty, by his willingness to, to set aside those things and become a servant. By that humility, we become rich in Jesus Christ. Faith is the key. We, we come to Christ and we look at him and we honor his example and, and what he did for us. And we place our faith in him that what he did, we can do as well as he calls us to that perspective. Faith's reward. See, that's our treasure is the reward of faith. We are poor in the world, but he calls us to be rich in faith. Heirs of the kingdom of God, we have something far more eternal. We have something that will last for all eternity. We are rich with the word of God. We are rich with relationship. That is, those are not just words. That's life to me. That's life to you to understand we have everything that we need. We have in abundance all that we will ever need. We are rich richly blessed beyond words and what we will experience someday with the Lord will put our law into perspective and so we must keep our eyes there all the time always be looking at what Jesus Christ has promised us I want to encourage you to always be looking ahead keep your eyes on eternity keep your eyes on the promises of God the contrast is this is that we live we live for the here and now the one who lays up treasure for himself is not rich towards God. In fact, we are bankrupt towards God. If we live for here and now, if we live for ourselves, if we live for things, if we live apart from God and try to acquire all that we can, if as, if as Christians in name we pursue everything in this world and we don't pursue Jesus Christ, how can we ultimately be called a child of God? He reminds us here that that's the contrast. As a child of God, whether we have money or not, whether we have lots of things or not, we are rich in Jesus Christ. Perspective of faith is everything. Paul, or the author here of Hebrews says, we joyfully accept the plundering of our property. We know ourselves that we have a better possession, an abiding possession. He reminds us here that we're to hold on to the things in our life loosely. But that's a challenge for me. It's a challenge for us to realize the things I own, they're just temporary. And, and I'm to hold on to those things loosely and, and not lose my sense of myself and my life and my temper and my whatever when I lose things and and things are, are damaged that I own. We're to be careful about the things that we pursue. Um, life is temporary. God wants us to always remember that. He wants us to pursue relationship with Him. He wants us to pursue the fruit that is eternal, pursuing those who need the Lord with the gospel. If you and I are a child of God, we always have, we always have something to share. We're to do good. We're to be rich because we are rich in good works, in, in how we serve Christ. We're to be generous. We're to be re ready to share. In other words, people are to see that our relationship with Christ is, is always a positive in our life. That your walk with the Lord is an abundance of joy because of what the Lord is doing in your life. How he has richly blessed you. That's to come from our life. It starts with conveying the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. We are rich 
in relationship. We are rich in promise. We are rich in hope. And God wants us to share that. And it must. It's got to come from our life. People need to see that that's true in our heart. Then he says, I know your slander. But it's worse than that. The word, the word there for slander is, is blasphemer. Blasphemia is what it is. He says, I know, I know that there are those who are speaking truth against you and using it as a weapon to hurt you. Sometimes slander is truth. There are those who are speaking falsehood against you and using it to hurt you. Slander is simply intended to hurt someone else, taking speech and using it to hurt others. But more than that, he says, here it's blasphemy. He says, specifically from those who call themselves a part of the family of God, Jews, they are found here not to be Jews, not true Jews, not Jews of faith, not children of God, because they belong to, synagogue, to Satan. How significant does he say? He says, verse 9, And I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. The thing that breaks our heart is when we see those who identify with God and yet do not walk with God, who do not have a relationship with Christ, who do things in the name of God, but without relationship and without power, without life transformation, without conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. He says, here are Jews who have the word of God, but they're, they're invested in destroying the church. They're invested in destroying the work of Jesus Christ. That's what they're facing. And so he makes a distinction, as Paul does, no one is a Jew who is one outwardly. The clothes, the law, the orthodoxy. A Jew is one inwardly. It's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the Spirit of God. And he reminds and encourages the church here at Smyrna, remember who you are. Remember your relationship. Remember the authenticity that you have in this relationship and stand strong and stand firm. He's encouraging them. He reminds them that Satan, this is a synagogue of Satan. Satan is our false accuser. He's the great accuser. They are accusing them. They are slandering the believers here. Before the city, before the officials, it is constant. It is ongoing. One day he's going to be thrown down. The accuser, Satan, the devil, he's going to be thrown down from heaven. Right now he's accusing us day and night. Every day he is at work accusing the believers, you and I, to undermine what we do, and yet Jesus Christ stands there as our advocate based on the relationship we have in Christ. We are reminded in Ephesians, we're to put on the whole armor of God. See, Jesus is power. That's how we stand. That's how we stand against uh, the false accuser, against slander, against spiritual warfare. We, we put on the Word of God. We take the Word of God and we live it. We take the Word of God and we apply it by faith. We take the Word of God and it, it makes its way into our, into our life and it's lived out in obedience and in faith. That becomes power. Jesus speaks to the church and then He says, here's the path I want you to, I want you to follow. Here's what, here's what needs to take place. Here's what needs to take place. Now, in this church, in Smyrna, there is no negative. He doesn't rebuke them for sin. He, he encourages them. And then he says this, don't fear. Do not fear. He says that in verse 10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. What is that? It's the opposition of the devil. That is what they're about to suffer. He says, some, some of you are going to be thrown into prison, and you're going to be tested for 10 days. You will be tested, and for 10 days you will have tribulation. And so he's, there's something very historical, very local, very applicable to this particular church. They're going to go through some kind of specific testing. Now, whether it's 10 literal days, it's quite possible it is. It may be, it may be a mechanism to, to express a period of time, a short period of time. But he's simply saying this, as a church, you're walking with me and you're doing it faithfully. But you are going to go through more testing. You're going to be brought. You're going to be brought before the courts, and it's not going to. It's not going to be easy. It takes us back to Daniel. Remember, Daniel is very much uh, a part of the Book of Revelation. It's foundational. It is fundamental to the Book of Revelation. In chapter one, we see Daniel and his friends uh, being given the opportunity to eat the king's food. To eat the king's food was, was to convey allegiance to the king. 
Daniel says we're not going to do that. We're going to eat a, a, a separate diet, a specific diet, vegetables and water, for 10 days. And God honored that and God blessed that. And so as John's writing these words, certainly he's remembering this episode here. And there's a couple other episodes where we have a 10-day period. The point is Smyrna's going to go through it. And it's going to be intense and it's not going to be easy. And he calls them to, uh, to stand in faith. Uh, in fact, he says, well, we're going to see that here in a second. We're reminded here that uh, evil men in the hands of God are used for the purposes of God. Revelation 17, for God had put it into their hearts, evil men, to carry out his purpose until the words of God are fulfilled. And so here we have uh, the Gentiles, we have the Jews who are, who are um, bringing great hardship and, and intense persecution on the church. And yet in God's perspective, in God's hands, you know what? He's doing something in their life. That's what he does in our life. God allows us to go through great hardship by people who hate us, difficult people in our life. We're to love them. We're to treat them with grace. We're to pray for them. We're to look for opportunities to be a witness to them. God says, whoever that person is in your life, whoever those people are in your life, whatever that situation is in your life, I want you to remember this. That's a part of my plan. I'm using it on your behalf for my glory. I love you. And these who are out to get you, they are fulfilling a purpose that I have for you and for his church that is good. We need to remember that. It happens even within his church sometimes. Paul says there, there are times here in Corinth, at times it's necessary for factions to come up in the life of a church so that those who are genuine and authentic can, can rise to the top and, and can be again be an example to the flock. The purpose is to highlight ultimately genuine faith and authenticity in relationship with Jesus Christ. And holiness. So he says here, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God says, I'm with you. I'm your God. I'm here to strengthen you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold you up and I'm going to do it with my right hand, which we have seen here in Revelation. So he calls them, this path, he calls them to be faithful. Verse 10. And so he, he says, um, be faithful unto death. Be faithful unto death. Maybe some will give their lives here. Some who are, who are being brought to court. Maybe there's a court setting, court elements here are, are being uh, uh, given the, the death penalty. We don't know for sure. But he says be faithful. Even if it means your life, be faithful. Be faithful. Be faithful. We are reminded in Matthew that faithfulness God rewards. The one who endures to the end will be saved. To fight the good fight, to finish the race, to do it well, to keep the faith, he promises a crown of righteousness. We need to keep, you and I need to keep our mind on what God has promised to us when we are faithful to him, when we give him glory, when we are a witness and a testimony to him. He calls us to be faithful. In the end, Satan is conquered by believers who walk in faithfulness. They have conquered him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ and by the word of their testimony. Uh, for they love not their lives even unto death, Revelation 12. We'll come to that. We'll speak to that. But that testimony is what God calls us to, simply to be faithful. Now the reminder here, God enables, he helps. You know, right now, just stop and think about your life. What is it that God's calling you to? What is it the path he's calling you to? What hardship has come, has come with obedience? What hardship has come with identifying with the name of Christ? What challenges are you facing because you love the Lord dearly with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind? What are things that are coming into your life simply because you are a genuine child of God? He wants us to remember here, and he wants all these churches to remember. Not only does he know us, and he is assessing us, and he's examining us, and he's laying before us a path, but he always wants to remind us. He wants us to know this. We don't, we don't walk on this walk of faith by ourselves. He's there to help us. He's with us. So again... We have this reminder in every in every uh, uh, church of these seven churches. We have the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The Spirit of God, He is speaking. We are called to hear. The Spirit of of the God is the one who enables us to hear. He opens the mind 
of our heart, the eyes of our heart, so we can see, hear, and understand. He illuminates our, our life so that we can understand the Word of God and the message of truth. The Spirit of God is always working. Notice in here very specifically as well. He's writing to the churches. Listen to what the Spirit of God says to the churches. This isn't written just to Smyrna. It's written to the seven churches. And it's written to the churches who exist in that day as the Word of God is going out. And it's written to the churches that are that are here now today, us, in 2000 and and 21 that are 20 that are listening to this message and, and opening the word of God. It is written to us. It is written to the churches. But more than that, it says, let him hear. That is singular. And so the, the message, the call, is not only to all of the churches. It's to you specifically who are listening right now. It's to me who is laying truth before us. The Spirit of God is called to speak into our life and to enable us in our lives, the ability to respond by faith. It is a work of the Spirit. We're to read the Word of God, we're to hear it, we're to keep it. And then Jesus Christ, again, He is the focus of the book of Revelation. He is the one who enables us to walk in victory, and He is the one who will help Smyrna, those churches, Emmanuel Baptist Church, your church, and us together as part of the church. And so Jesus says, as we continue... He says in verse 8, And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write the words of the first and the last. We are reminded here that Jesus Christ is eternal. Whatever he promises and whatever he writes in these letters is grounded on the foundation of his character. He is, he is eternal, the first and the last. We see that in chapter 1, verse 17. He is sovereign in every way. We can never, ever, ever forget that. That is significant. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is God. He is deity. He is sufficient. He is powerful. And not only that, He is eternal. And He is, no, not only that, He is overcomer. He is, he is the first and the last. But also notice in verse 8, He says, And the one who died and came to life. This one, this one who is eternal, who has always been and always will be, He was able to die in His humanity. He gave his life for us, and he overcame sin. He overcame death. He won it by living here among us with, with absolute holiness and righteousness. And he went to the cross, and he won the victory. So he, he, he knows what it means to overcome. He enables us to overcome because he did the same thing. See, the key to overcoming is faith, your faith and our faith in Christ. Who, who is it that overcomes? The one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, some of these verses we've seen before. It's important, though. They're significantly important to each of these churches and to us. They are intended to be reminders into our life. Christ has already won the victory. Take heart. Folks, be encouraged. Be encouraged. He says, I've already overcome the world. I want you to be encouraged this morning. If you are a faithful, obedient follower of Jesus Christ, he's going to... He's going to lead you down a road that is filled with blessing and, and brings joy. But it, it is a road that involves real hardship and sacrifice and an unconditional love for Him. And He's there to help us. Not only that, we see His promise to us, the promises that the Lord gives us. See, it's His enablement. Look at verse 10. And so He, he, he writes in verse, in verse 10, um, We're to be faithful unto death. He says, be faithful, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. What he promises to us, that is his promise. When we are faithful, what he has promised to give to us is the crown of life. He says, be faithful to the end, be faithful to death, be faithful to the very last breath. Never stop being faithful. To you and to I this morning, he says to us, never stop being faithful. If you're a senior, if you're young, be committed in your heart to being faithful, to continue to do in your life what you've always done. Don't set aside those things because you've served the Lord and now you're done. He says, be faithful. Serve Him faithfully. Serve Him faithfully and love Him deeper than you ever have. He calls us to be faithful. The crown of life. What a promise. They would have understood that concept of crown. The history of the Olympics being a part of this city. Of, of, of those athletics and, and just that crown. Here it's not a temporary crown. It's not a wreath. It's eternal. James chapter 1. Blessed 
is the man who remains steadfast under trial. When he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. That's it. That's simple. Boy, that's, that's life eternal. That's relationship. He's promised to you and I. The mark of a genuine believer is faithfulness. Faithfulness to his word. Faithfulness to Jesus Christ. And he's promised to everyone who is faithful to his word and to him, he will give eternal life. Those aren't instruments of salvation. Those aren't works by which we are saved. They are evidences of genuine faith. We're not saved by faithfulness. Faithfulness affirms. It affirms that you are a child of God. It affirms that you are in love with Jesus Christ. It affirms that that relationship is authentic and real. Authentic and real. And then he says this. He enables us. He gives us a second promise here. Not, will not be hurt by the second death. Verse 11. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Who are we? We're overcomers. That's who we are. We're overcomers. We'll not be brought under the consequence, the judgment of the second death. When we die physically, when a person dies, when a loved one dies, that's the first death. Everyone who has ever lived, unless the Lord returns in the rapture and comes to take his church, until that happens, all of us, we have a death sentence over our life. We're going to die physically. That's the first death. And so we're called not to be afraid. Do not fear those who can kill the body that first death. Cannot, they cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. He is the one who has final judgment over the soul of man, over your soul and mine. The second death is, is that judgment against those who stand separated from him. Luke puts it this way. We're to fear him who after he has killed has authority to cast into, into hell. When I've died, Jesus Christ has authority then to, to cast the unbeliever, the one who, who does not have a relationship, he has the authority, the ability, the right to, to cast that person into hell. That's what we must fear. That's why we must be passionate about the gospel. The people would meet Christ. Revelation shares the great white throne. I saw a great white throne, him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled. No place was found for them. And death, that again, the consequence of sin, and Hades, where, where unbelievers go, were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. One day, all unbelievers are going to stand before the Lord. Every one of them that has ever lived and in, and in this great white throne, they will be separated from Christ. They will be separated from relationship. They will for all time be separated in eternal judgment and will be thrown into hell. This is the second death. They will have died the first death. They, they will have physically died. We will have had funerals for them and memorials for them, maybe honored them. But here, because they don't have Christ over their life, they will stand before the Lord filthy because of sin, and they will be separated and cast out from his presence. This is the second death. We are to be overcomers. In all these things, in all this walk of faith, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us. He calls us to give the message of the gospel. He calls us to live it, and he calls us to be overcomers because he loved us. Ultimate victory is, is ultimate reward in our life. The one who conquers will have this heritage, that is eternal life. I will be his God and he will be my son. Ultimately, Smyrna is reminding us that they face death. They face spiritual warfare. Satan specifically, the devil specifically. They had hardship and adversity in their life. Yet they were proven through that hardship. They were proven through that adversity to be genuine children of God because they were people of faith. They had placed their faith in Jesus Christ. They were faithful to the end. They followed the Lord Jesus Christ in obedience. And he promised to them, and he gave to them, and he gives to us the crown of life. I want you to think about the church in Ephesus, and the church in Smyrna. We were called in Ephesus to, to return to our first love to, love, to love Jesus Christ with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, to love our neighbors as ourselves. 
here in Smyrna, we're called, we're called to, be, to be faithful. To be faithful to the end. Be faithful to the end. Just in a summary thought, this is a good verse to put on your heart for this week. To be praying it over your heart. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. You and I, we have the ability to thrive in any circumstance. No matter what's happening in our life, we have the ability to thrive. We thrive because that flows from a love relationship with Jesus Christ. And we have the ability to thrive because we are faithful to the Lord. We come to Him in faith each and every day. We start every day brand new, exhibiting faith in Christ. This verse is just a reminder to us that we are called to be uh, people who love Him, with everything and are faithful to him. That's the ministry of Ephesus. That's the ministry of Smyrna in our life. Jesus is coming back. Are you ready? Are you motivated? Does it motivate you that he's coming again? Does it motivate you what he's done for your life? May you and I be like the believers here in Smyrna. May we be faithful to the end, no matter how hard it gets. May we stand clearly for Christ. In a culture who is increasingly hating Christians and Christianity and truth and the Word of God, may we be people of grace. May we stand firm on the truth of God's Word, but may we exhibit the love of God as we communicate its truth. May God help us to that end, that we would simply be faithful in character, faithful from our hearts, faithful in loving Him in obedience. May we be like the believers here in Smyrna. May God look at our life and be able to commend you and I because that quality is true in our life. And that faithfulness is rooted in the love that we find in Ephesus as well. Lord, help us to this end. What a glory it is to walk with Jesus Christ, to be faithful on the course that you have planted for us. God, may your love strengthen and encourage and infuse us with strength May the truth of God's word be our foundation. May we be faithful to the end, people of grace, that the good news of Jesus Christ will be conveyed through our life, no matter how they treat us. May our lives show Jesus Christ clearly and with power. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you next week.